This is Dan McCarthy, and you're listening to the Check In Podcast. Our space travel future is here. According to the New York Times, in late 2021, the world passed the 600 person in space milestone, a number that seemed incredibly impossible just a few decades prior, but one that is now expected to grow exponentially higher due to the emergence of Taurus spaceflight. Companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and more are already pursuing this kind of flight, and there's a growing population of private companies preparing themselves for this next chapter in travel, bringing consumers to space to see the world from a totally different perspective, one that can only be had far above sea level. For so many years, the dream of getting to space was something that could only be achieved by a, a tiny minority of people, people who either had the intelligence and the ability to become an astronaut, or now more recently, those with the means to afford it, people like Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos or William Shatner, who was one of the more famous recent people to go into space. That second group is now set to grow from a tiny minority over the next decade or so to something a lot larger. My guest for this episode is the CEO of, of one of those companies who are pursuing this kind of travel. Jane Pointer is the CEO of Space Perspective, a new company that touts itself as the world's first luxury spaceflight experience company. The plan for Space Perspective is to kick off a new chapter in luxury flight starting in 2024, taking consumers up to space via a balloon at a speed that's slower than a river cruise ship, slowly but surely introducing consumers to the world amongst the stars with a cost less than, according to Bloomberg, of a lightly used Aston Martin or matching Bell and Ross watches. Jane was kind enough to talk to me recently about her background and about space perspective ahead of the company's 2024 official launch. She has an extensive background and we couldn't fit it into a half hour or so. And so I'll link some of the experiences, including her time in Biosphere 2 in the episode description below. But what you should know about her is that she's incredibly adventurous and she sees not only the future of an industry in space, but the future of human perspective, knowing how this kind of experience can change someone's outlook on the world and on their own lives. It's always an exciting time for people in the travel industry. If you, if you speak to anyone who's worked in this industry for a long time, they'll tell you that's what they love most about their jobs is the people they meet, the places they can go. But I promise you listening to Jane talk about space perspective and talk about the future of space tourism in general will make you even more hopeful in the future. So let's check in with Jane and the future of travel. Hi, Jane. How are you? Good, how are you? I am peachy. <laughs> are you back in, I know you were in New York uh, throughout the week last week, but are you, are you back in Florida? I am back in Florida, indeed. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to say thanks for taking the time to, to talk to me today. I know uh, things must be getting fairly busy with, with Space Perspective. They are, which is a good thing. Yeah. I'd love to sort of get an introduction first to you because I think that's reading about your background. It, it just seems like it, I would be missing a huge opportunity if I didn't take a chance to sort of ask you about your background and all the incredibly unique and adventurous things you've done in your career. It, it just seems like you've had sort of a one, one in a million journey. Thank you. Yes, I have been incredibly lucky to do some extraordinary things and actually my most of my uh, career journey has been in parallel with my founder and co-CEO Tabor McCallum. We actually both started out on the design team of a project called Biosphere 2, uh, where eight of us were eventually sealed for two years and 20 minutes inside the world's first attempt at a new, uh, at a human-made biosphere. The idea being uh, planet Earth is biosphere one, biosphere two is the one we lived in. It was totally sealed. And it was in essence a prototype space base that we lived inside. It was also a laboratory for learning more about our planetary biosphere. Uh, and, and it was an extraordinary experience in and of itself. 
happy to talk about that in a minute if you'd like. But that really launched Tabor and me into the quest of how do we take people to space in a way that's truly accessible. Uh, we founded a company called Paragon while we were in the biosphere with somebody we actually had never met in person, uh, which I think is familiar now for people uh, now that we've all been you know locked down a bit during COVID this whole interaction has become a lot more familiar but at the time it was very unusual but of course we were locked inside we met him one time when he came to the window on the outside and we started this amazing company called Paragon which uh, does all kinds of technologies for spacecraft, spacesuits, space spaces, underwater, things like that. So the company now, 29 years on, has technologies on just about every single human spacecraft in operation by the US today and soon going to the moon. So that's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, and then we took uh, our team, took Alan Eustace, the then Google executive, underneath a space balloon, similar to the kind that we'll be using with Spaceship Neptune, to 136,000 feet in a spacesuit our team designed, intentionally dropped him uh, for him to break the Rebel Stratos jump, which uh, I'm sure you are very familiar with. Most people have heard of that. We didn't do press around it, so you really wouldn't have heard around, uh, about it, but it was, uh, it was an extraordinary thing for us and our team to have done uh, because that really set us up now to be able to develop what we're doing now with space perspective, taking as many people as possible to space, but instead of in a spacesuit, in a very comfortable capsule. Okay, yeah, I, I and there'll be no, I, I, I know we're going to get into it, but I know there'll be no Red Bull free fall sort of with space perspective. Uh, yeah, that won't be an there, option, there no. will not be any Red Bull free yeah. falls. That's exactly right. You go up under the balloon and you come right back down <laughs> under the balloon. So it is an extremely seamless and comfortable journey the entire way. Yeah, so I know you mentioned Biosphere 2. I don't want to ask too much about that, but I know people will be interested in that. And you've written a lot about your experience in Biosphere 2, um, correct? Like if people, if people want to hear more about that, there's avenues they can take to go go do so. Yeah, actually, it was fun. I wrote a book called The Human Experiment, Two Years and 20 Minutes Inside Biosphere 2, which is available on Amazon or wherever you get your, your reading from. Um, yeah. And uh, it was really a, telling sort of the adventure story of being in there as, long, as well as a lot of the science, because it really was the first time this had ever been attempted. You know, and for me, what was so astounding and in, to a degree, why it set Tabor and me off on a course to pursue human space flight for all of us is the experience of being part of our biosphere enclosed in a very finite biosphere that became extremely apparent that it was finite. You know, you could see the walls of our biosphere. You know, I knew moment to moment that as I was breathing, I was breathing the oxygen for all, from all the plants that were managing our atmosphere, if you will, creating our atmosphere. Uh, and then my CO2 was uh, growing the food we were eating. And so it was this very strong interplay. And it, was an, it gave us a very interesting perspective about the, the biosphere that we were inhabiting. But then by extension, it gave us a visceral understanding of what it is to be a crew member on a, in a planetary biosphere, in other words, spaceship Earth, that we all inhabit together. Well, it turns out that this is the experience that astronauts have when they're in space. They just have it from a different vantage point. They see our planetary biosphere, spaceship Earth, from the outside, looking back at our planet in the context of this vast black vacuum we call space. And, and it's a very powerful experience. So, I mean, where did where did this sense of adventure or exploration or wonder, I mean, come from? Because to me, setting out on a project like Biosphere 2 or, or any of the other projects you have sort of on your resume, it seems like it'd be incredibly daunting. It would cause a lot of anxiety in a lot of people to to do that. And I'm wondering, I mean, what where did that mentality come from for you? Yeah, you know, I think I was extremely lucky from very early on in my life that I met people who were doing extraordinary things. So one of them was a woman called Claire Francis, who lived 
pretty close to where I grew up in Southern England. I grew up sailing and okay. she was the first woman to sail single-handedly across the Atlantic. You know, and then I looked at people like Jane Goodall, who also a country woman of mine, who was really changing how we thought about primates and going out on her own into Africa. Well, I guess she went with a mother as support. You know, it, it, the fact that it was potentially very difficult did not stop either of them. And, uh, you know, even in my early 20s, I, I met these amazing big, not just big thinkers, but the important part, it is big thinkers who also do big. They know how to take these big ideas and, and really take them and run with them. And, and that was a huge gift that I was given early in my life. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. I mean, was there anything in particular with space that made you sort of look above? Like, was there, was there anything that caused the sort of interest in, in space exploration too? Well, I also was one of those kids who liked to hide under my blanket at night with a torch reading, reading Isaac Asimov. Okay. What I yeah. loved about it was the imagination about what the future could be. You know, and a, a lot of the sci-fi then was really not dystopian. It was very much about the possibilities for the future, the excitement for what our collective future could be both here on earth and beyond. And that to me was hugely inspiring. I think uh, things like Star Trek, yeah. you know, is it's also for the most part, a very positive view of the future, no. which I think is is hugely important for us to have. So let's like I think let's talk about the future and uh, particularly space perspective because uh, my interest in this has been over the past couple months and this space exploration thing seemed so far away a few years ago when people started talking about it in the mainstream media and consumer media. Uh, but hearing about it, hearing about space, space perspective in particular over the past couple of months, it doesn't seem far away. It doesn't seem inaccessible. It, it seems it seems like the future is here, which is which seems it's a cliche to say, but it, it very much does seem like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, obviously that, that we are working uh, very hard to make space as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Yeah. You know, what, what's, what I think is, is, is fun to think about is to a degree, uh, space travel, space tourism is that overnight success that has been 30 years in the making. And I've been lucky enough to be involved in it right from the get go. So I've really seen this all the way through, you know, when you look back and you think that in the early 2000s, I think there was eight or 10 people when uh, uh, private citizens went to space, they in the first decade, uh, and they all went on government vehicles. And now last year, many times that went to space and mostly went on commercial vehicles. And uh, this year, you're going to see more again. So you're really beginning to see that knee in the curve where this brand new industry is really taking hold. And of course, we're planning to be flying in 24. And you know, we're going to be able to scale fairly quickly, meaning we'll be able to take a fair number of people very quickly. So you really are right at that knee in the curve of this industry uh, developing, which is incredibly exciting. Yeah, and I know the cost, I mean, the cost isn't outrageous either compared to other luxury. And I know you're calling this, the Space Perspective is calling this a luxury travel, a luxury space travel company, which is, I know it very much is. Um, but the cost isn't going to be inaccessible. And I imagine with scaling in the future, that that could also change as well. Yeah, that's right. So if you think that going to something like the International Space Station, you know, is 50 million plus or something like that. Yeah. Okay, that's 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 not for everyone. Uh, uh, we are what's called a suborbital flight, which means we go up to space and then come back down again. So the same as other companies that you will have seen go there with rockets. And, you know, those cost anywhere from 450K, a million dollars plus a seat. Uh, and so we are able to offer it at, at $125,000 a seat. And right now, what's cool is people can just get their 
uh, a ticket for a $1,000 refundable deposit. So you, know, you can go online and get your ticket to space. Oh, and we take crypto, which is also pretty cool. So you mentioned the other, your, I guess you would call them competitors, but the other people, the other companies pursuing this kind of travel and other companies already doing this kind of travel. I mean, what makes Space Perspective different from, from Blue Origin or from uh, SpaceX or Virgin Galactic? Right. Yeah. So, so the huge difference, I mean, it is an enormous experiential difference. So I think when we, when most people think about space travel, they think about discomfort, training, special suits, high G's, you know, rockets, noise, vibration, all of that, right? I mean, that's part of the excitement of watching a rocket launch is the energy it takes to get up, up out of the gravity well. Well, for us, it is completely the opposite. It's silent. It's graceful when it launches. You're going to space at 12 miles an hour. So it's this very gentle rise up to space. You'll have hours in space to enjoy this incredible view. Uh, you're in a space lounge, which you know just by the name gives you a sense that it's this very comfortable capsule that gives you this incredible 360 degree view. You can be sitting there with your loved ones chatting and sharing it with people in the capsule and people on the ground, there's a bar on board. So you can have, you know, a cuisine and a beverage experience while you're up there. Of course, there's a loo. It, it's just completely reimagined what this experience of space travel can be so that so many more people are gonna be able to go. Yeah, and I am like the way you're describing it, the way you described it, I've heard you describe it. Uh, it, it doesn't even seem as, it seems like, getting on an airplane is a step up in like you mentioned the experience uh, the relative experience of, of uh, simply floating up upwards in a balloon um and it, no, yeah. so you won't get so so the, the the big difference in experience there between this and sort of flying in an airplane is that an airplane is going through the air and so that's where you you know quite fast so okay. that's where you get turbulence and things like that with this you're not even going to really feel turbulence it's very smooth so uh, I know, I know one thing us it won't have is uh, the feeling of weightlessness that won't be available to uh, space perspective users. So you're right. So the the weightlessness is is about the particular kind of flight that you do, or whether you're going seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour, like uh, like the International Space Station, for instance. Um, so what's interesting about that is that. Uh, if you really want to get it, you can get it on an airplane. Uh, there are zero G flights in yeah. an airplane. And honestly, for many people, the zero G experience is distracting because you not, don't necessarily feel your best. So what we've done is really separate, separated those experiences. So when you go up to space, you are there able to really fully focus on on that experience of seeing Earth in space. And I, I think that's really critical because, you know, when we think about this experience, you know, we're not, we're not just going up there to, have, to see a pretty view. When you talk to astronauts about their experience of seeing Earth in space, I mean, it's deeply moving and it changes their, their perspective for the rest of their lives. So being able to give people time to really focus on this incredible view of our beautiful planet, that thin blue line, that iconic blue line that we see in the images, but see it for real with, our, with the curved horizon against the black sky so that our sun looks like a giant star. I mean, it's just going to be really extraordinary. There's no question about it. So being able to really separate that from any other aspect uh, of spaceflight, I think is actually quite a plus for people. I have a few more questions about the experience, but I did want to ask about that. I mean, it, there does seem to be something to be said about the impact of this on anyone, anyone who gets that view, like you mentioned, or is being able to have that perspective. Uh, I mean, from the people you've spoken to, I mean, what what's the impact of a journey like that and sort of the perspective it provides to people, especially here on earth when you mm. you very rarely ever get that perspective mm. no i think that's right so so when you there's been some studies done to look at does this actually change behavior 
And what's interesting is that when you look at astronauts when they've been in space, and I'm talking NASA astronauts, you find that they get much more involved in social and environmental causes when they return from space than before they left. So it actually tends to change not just your perspective, but through that perspective change also perhaps changes your life's focus a little bit or expands expands it a little bit. So I am expecting that some percentage of our customers are really going to resonate with that experience. And I love to think about what effect that has on society when we've had thousands, hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of people going to space and having this experience of sort of becoming one with the human family on Spaceship Earth and having that realization that you are a crew member on Spaceship Earth, I think is incredibly important. And it will have a ripple effect across society, I think, I think is, you know, is, is an exciting thing for us to get up every day in the morning and work on. So uh, the, the two things I think uh, my audience particularly want to know is how often is the are you planning to fly uh, starting starting in 2024? And how many how big is the cabin going to be? So how many what's the capacity of each flight? Yeah, so the, the capsule, the space lounge accommodates up to eight passengers and a pilot. And I say up to because we, we've actually designed it to be really flexible so that you could have fewer people take out some of the seats you know, really uh, ch change it around inside. So you could have a wedding or, I don't know, a, a dining table or whatever it is that you particularly want uh, that's different from our standard eight seat configuration uh, is pretty exciting that we can do. Are you near MCO then? I know, are you in Orlando? No, actually I'm on the Space Coast. So, oh, okay. we, so our operation center is on Kennedy Space Center. Uh, but we are, I'm actually right outside the gate at Space Coast Spaceport, oh, which wow. is also an operating airport. So right outside the window, we actually had an air, ho air show here yesterday, which was okay. Cool. And that's, that's where the initial 2024, that's where your schedule is yeah. going to kick off, right? It's going to, it's going to be the Kennedy Space Center. Yeah. So, uh, some of our flights will definitely be going from, uh, Kennedy Space Center and other launch sites in Florida. But very quickly, we want to fly from other places around the world uh, so that we can have people have different experiences from all over the world. You know, it's, it's really fun when, when you talk to astronauts about what are the most amazing things to see from space. Uh, and after they say, well, everything, of course, once they've <laughs> done saying that, then they start saying things like, well, actually, where the ocean and the land meets is amazing because of the colors uh, of the sea in those areas. And we'll be flying up from here when we first start flying uh, from the Space Coast in Florida, you'll be able to see across the Bahamas, which apparently is some of the most incredible places to see from space for colors and you know, seeing that between the islands and all of that. Then you can see down uh, to the Keys, which is going to be amazing across into the Gulf. The other thing they say is amazing to see is things you recognize. And of course, every American will recognize Florida, which is really cool. So flying from Europe would be awesome. Be able to see the boot of Italy or other amazing things. And I'm sure everybody has their different favorite thing they'd want to see from space. Uh, and uh, we're going to be able to accommodate a lot of that. Um, and so it'll, it'll, what's the plan? It'll, it'll, will it return to where it, where it takes off or will it, will the journey end up somewhere else? Yeah. So as I, as I mentioned, it's a suborbital flight, which means it does go up to space and comes back down, not too far from, from where it okay. launches from. Um, so last year, for example, we did a flight from here, uh, a test flight that went extraordinary well. Uh, and it splashed down because we do splash uh, 50 miles off the coast in the Gulf, exactly where we wanted it to splash. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that that was a really exciting test, actually. And then the, the length of these trips will be about six hours. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So it's okay. two hours up to space, roughly two hours at the top, and then approximately another two hours to come down. You will splash and the ship will be right there. It'll pick the capsule up out of the water, 
put it onto the deck so our explorers will just get straight out of the capsule onto the deck to make it super easy. Uh, and so that whole that whole experience, uh, once you're out on the deck, you know, roughly between six and seven hours, and then we'll bring everybody ashore. And what's important about it, that very last part, so I've heard a lot of people, even the people that have most recently gone up on, say, the Blue Origin flight, talk about needing time to really absorb the experience. So I think it's going to be amazing to actually have time at sea as you're on your way back to shore to really, for our customers to really be able to take that time. Sort of really think about what they just experienced between each other and for themselves. Yeah, that I never even thought about that too. That is that is an excellent point. And then I know I know demand has already been pretty high. I know it's it's it seems like a good, an easy thing to do to put down a thousand dollar deposit to have a once in a lifetime opportunity experience. But uh, demand has been pretty strong for those for that initial slate of flights, right? Oh yeah. So um, so we're planning to fly uh, in the first year. We're going to go a little slow. We're going to do roughly twenty five flights in the first year of operations. But after that, we're going to scale very quickly. So we have already sold about 100 flights. Uh, so we need to scale quickly so we can, okay. uh, we can accommodate all the people that want to go. Okay. Uh, and by the way, that's been uh, in under a year since we put sales uh, tickets on sale publicly, which is pretty awesome. And are you doing a ton of more? Like, it doesn't seem like this is a being pushed to consumers that hard. Like it doesn't, it doesn't seem like you're doing a hard sell on this. So making that, being able to sell that many flights is, is obviously this tells you something about the experience. I think it tells you something about the experience and the excitement around, around this. I mean, look, it's, a, it's to a degree, it's a new destination. We're opening up a whole new realm for people to go visit. Yeah, I know. So a few years ago in the in the travel industry, I'm, the Galapagos seemed to be trending because they were, cruise lines were building custom built ships to be able to visit that area, and it seemed like it, it seemed like it, it, this seems like just such a giant leap ahead of that, uh, and another opportunity. So it is it is nice to hear that people are are interested in it. Uh, I want to ask about two things that I think consumers will know about. One people who are prone to nausea. I know it might be a weird question when you're going to space, but people who are prone to nausea, is that a worry? And then two, what about the people who are a little bit shy about safety and things like that? I mean, mm -hmm. it, how would you, how would you obey those, those fears? So the nausea thing is uh, for anybody who is prone to that, be really happy. We don't have microgravity involved. Okay. Uh, because that if anybody who has that uh, concern, we don't have that. So there won't be any of that issue. Uh, so that's, that's number one. On the safety, so this is really an inherently safe way of going to space. You know, first of all, it's very low energy. We're going very slowly. Nothing happens very quickly. Uh, then if you look at the, the vehicle itself, we are uh, based, basing our entire vehicle on very well-established technology. So the space balloon has actually been flown by NASA, other governments, and members of our team more than a thousand times. Uh, so it is very well understood and successfully safe uh, technology. Um, Obviously, we still need to uh, have backup systems in the event of any kind of anomaly. So between the capsule and the space balloon is a parachute system we call the reserve descent system. Uh, that is very similar to the kind, well, it actually is the kind of parachutes that have been flown over a thousand times from these altitudes and even from space, which is a much more dynamic environment. And it, it has never failed in all that time. So the, it's inherently safe. And then the other thing is, you know, unlike when you look at every other vehicle out there, you know, what, what uh, most people may not think about is that the capsule where the people are separates at some point from its primary flight system, right? If you look at the Blue Origin flight, at some point that capsule comes flying off the top of the rocket and then the parachute has to open and then it comes back down onto the parachute. Our system doesn't have any of those complexities. We've eliminated all of those because you go up under the balloon and then you come gently back down under the balloons. So you've just eliminated all those pathways for risk. So all in all, this ends up being a very safe system. Yeah, and I know uh, again the the term luxury is a, a bit 
heavily used now in the travel industry, but this does seem like an like a very much a, a luxury experience from from the way it travels to the onboard experience to the care they the consumers or clients would get on board. Uh, it, it seems like a perfect luxury experience for people who are used to that, that kind of travel. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. So uh, and we're, we we uh, will be making it very bespoke for okay. people. So when people buy their ticket, that's when their journey begins with us. And we want to know what people are expecting for their flight. How, how can we help people make the most of their flight? We're going to be having behind the scenes tours here at Kennedy Space Center where we've already had starting to have events. Like we just had an event at the Explorers Club in, uh, in New York that was really fun. It was one of our first where we invited some explorers, uh, potentially future explorers, so that people could get to know each other. Uh, and of course, our uh, senior technical advisor, Jeff Hoffman was there talking about his experience uh, and he's gonna be involved along the way with our explorers as well to help everyone really get prepared for this extraordinary flight. Um, so my last question to you is, I mean, we spoke about the future. I know, I know the future is very bright for space perspective and for this industry in general, but I, I, from where you're sitting now, do you have a view on sort of what the future of this experience is? I mean, down the line, this industry and this segment as a whole, five, 10 years, do you see it becoming as accessible as uh, many people hope it will become? Yeah, I, I do think so. So, you know, it was interesting when you look back in history and you think about where, where we were, you know, at the beginning of commercial aviation, it was expensive. It was really uh, just for governments and a few people that could afford it. And now look, right? I mean, so many people are using aviation in ways that we could never have imagined when the industry first began. And we're at that same stage with this industry. You know, it's hard for us to imagine right now, I think, how space travel is going to be used in the future and how many millions of people are going to be flying. You know, I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an incredibly exciting time uh, and it's just really hard for us really to get our heads around how big this is going to be, but it's here. Yeah. And we're going to go other places beyond Earth. But for me, what's exciting about this from where we are really focusing our attention is not so much going beyond, but looking back, looking back at Earth and really helping people see our planet as just that, a planet in space. I mean, is that where the name comes from? Is that, I mean, space perspective, it's, it seems like that concept is, is, a perfect, if is a perfect way to segment into the name. Yes, yeah. completely. That's yeah. exactly where the name comes from, yeah. Um, so if, if travel, if travel agents or, or consumers want to find out more about space, space perspective, they heading to the website seems to be the best, the best place to start. Yes. I would say head to the website, uh, obviously get yourself familiar. Uh, we love working with travel agents, travel advisors, uh, actually Adida Tepa is our head of, uh, global sales with travel partners. She would love to talk with anybody who would love to get involved. Uh, you can reach her at adita at spaceperspective.com, E-D-Y-T-A at spaceperspective.com, uh, or just send us an email and, and she'll get that and would love to, to uh, talk with you about that. And I know, I know some advisors and agents I've spoken to have already started putting this on, on what they're selling to their clients. And they've had, I know, I know a few of them have had very strong interests already. So it is a great opportunity for not just the world, but for, for travel advisors, business in particular. Um, but Jane, again, I want to say thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I know, uh, I know things are, are moving very quickly for you and your company and, and things are very fast. So uh, I appreciate any and all time I can get. No, I appreciate it. And this was fun. Thanks so much indeed. All right. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully many people will see you soon and hopefully I'll, I'll bump into you somewhere along the way as well. Sounds great. Looking right. forward to it. All right. It was, it was nice to see you again. Okay. Take care.